Okay, moving on to COPD. There's a couple findings here that will be important. The first thing to notice is look how hyperinflated this person's lungs are. That is one of the hallmark signs of COPD. Another thing that you should be looking at is the diaphragm. This is what's called a flattened diaphragm, okay? So let's just compare this to a normal diaphragm. If you look here, look how curvy this diaphragm is here, whereas this person's diaphragm is just so flat, both on the lateral and the frontal x-ray. The final finding here is this increased anterior to posterior thoracic ratio, um, which is called barrel chest. This is another finding of COPD. So pneumoperitoneum, this is free air as a result of perforated bowel. So you can see here, you have free air under the diaphragm, as we've seen in a prior image. One common thing to mistake for free air under the diaphragm is actually the stomach gas bubble. Often you can see some food like this, and then an air bubble right here. That is not free air under the diaphragm. That is just air within the stomach. This is another sign right here. This is an abdominal x-ray, but this is called Wrigler's sign. It's just also a sign of pneumoperitoneum. You can see this increased contrast of the bowel wall. This is a normal abdominal x-ray down here. The reason that you have this increased contrast is because you have air, which is improving the contrast. So you get this more brightly lit up bowel wall here. Okay, moving on to small bowel obstruction. Okay, I know this isn't chest x-ray anymore, but I just wanted to do a couple x-rays of the abdomen as well, just because they're pretty high yield, I think, and I think it would be useful to go over here. So small bowel obstruction, and this is going to be something like you have an obstruction right here. So everything proximal to this obstruction is going to dilate, and everything past this obstruction is going to be collapsed. Okay. So what is the most common cause of small bowel obstruction? Well, the number one cause in adults is adhesions from surgery. And the number one cause in kids who generally have not had many surgeries would be a hernia. Okay, very, very common pimp question. You're probably going to get this on your surgery rotation. Okay, number one in adults, adhesions. Number one in kids, hernia. What is the normal width of small bowel, large bowel, and the cecum? This is good because if you measure the thickness, for example, right here, and you see that it's too thick compared to what it normally should be, then you could be more suspicious that there's some kind of obstruction going on or some kind of process that's causing it to be dilated. This is easy to remember with the 369 rule. So three centimeters is the normal width of the small bowel. Six centimeters is the normal width of the large bowel. And nine centimeters is the normal width of the cecum. So anytime you start to go over 9, 10 centimeters for the cecum, that's when you kind of get concerned for uh, a perforation uh, of the cecum. Okay, here is another picture I wanted to show. This is just showing you how to identify small bowel versus large bowel. Small bowel, you'll have the plique circularis, which go all the way across the bowel. And again, should be 3 centimeters. And you have the plique circularis spanning entire width of the bowel. On the other hand, for the large bowel, you can see it's a little bit wider. Remember, it can go up to six centimeters. And here you have hostra, the hostral folds, which do not go all the way across the width of the bowel. Okay. Okay, so pretty easy to identify small bowel from large bowel. Just check to see if the uh, lines indenting over them are going the full width, which would be small bowel, or if they're only going part of the way, which would be large bowel. Okay, here's an example of small bowel obstruction on both of these images. Here's the stomach bubble I was talking about earlier, so don't confuse this with free air under the diaphragm and say this is pneumoperitoneum. This is just stomach bubble right here. So for small bowel obstruction, you're going to get some of these findings. This is called stack of coins. And notice that you don't see any colon, which would generally be going like this, the S ascending colon, uh, transverse colon, and the descending colon. You don't see any colon. You only see small bowel right here. And here, this is called the slinky sign, or the step ladder appearance. These are both signs of small bowel obstruction. Now, one other thing I wanted to talk about is ileus. So ileus is just kind of 
your bowel motility is disrupted. This often happens after surgery. This is why you're always asking if your surgery patients have had a bowel movement yet after surgery, because the anesthesia causes their bowel motility to kind of be decreased. Okay, so this you will see dilated loops of both small bowel and large bowel. And there's one point I wanted to go over here, which is the difference in timing between small bowel obstruction and ileus. So ileus is kind of immediately after surgery, you'll have ileus. Whereas small bowel obstruction will be like one or two plus weeks after, okay? Because now you're starting to get the adhesions and all these other things that can cause this small bowel obstruction. Ileus is really just immediate side effect of the anesthesia. So if somebody comes in one to two weeks later with no bowel movements uh, for the past three days, you should be more concerned for small bowel obstruction rather than ileus because the timing fits small bowel obstruction more than it does for ileus. And now just to close things off, just some miscellaneous signs and things that I thought were interesting. So here is the chilididi sign. This is when a loop of bowel actually transpositions over the liver. It can cause some pain, but generally it's asymptomatic. It's pretty rare, but you may see this. And it's one of the reasons why if you're getting a liver biopsy or anything like that, a lot of times it's good to have image guidance so you know that there's no bowel overlying the liver and you're not going to just perforate it by trying to take a biopsy through a piece of bowel. This is a chili DD sign. I think I, I just put it in here because I thought it was a very interesting sign. This is the reverse S sign of golden. So this signifies right upper lobe atelectasis. And when you get this reverse S sign, then this is very specific for right upper lobe atelectasis due to a tumor. Okay, so this is the reverse S sign of golden. And this is actually a very high yield one. So this is subsegmental atelectasis. So a lot of times you're going to get an x-ray and you're going to see some of these linear lines coming out, but you don't think it's a pneumonia. You don't think they have heart failure or pleural effusion. This is actually subsegmental atelectasis. So this is in patients who aren't really taking deep breaths all the time. They can get little small segments of their lung to collapse, which can cause this appearance of an opacification. Uh, but they're not having a pneumonia or a CHF exacerbation or anything like that. And so this is actually very commonly seen on the wards. So I thought this is a, a good thing for you to know. So if you see this and you think that they're not having anything going on really, you can suggest that maybe they're having some subsegmental atelectasis in that area as well. All right. And then finally, I just wanted to close off with a discussion of some of the terms you use when you're describing an x-ray. So we have these terms, opacification, density, infiltrate, consolidation. From what it sounds like to me, okay, it seems like a lot of these terms are not very standardized. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. But generally, these are pretty broad, opacification and density. So you can almost always be pretty safe saying, oh, I see some opacity or opacification in this area or region. And then infiltrate versus consolidation, I think it kind of has to do with what's currently on your differential. Infiltrate, uh, a lot of times I feel like it's used more when you're expecting kind of fluid or something infiltrating that area, something like a CHF exacerbation, something like that. Whereas consolidation, you're thinking more like, oh, pneumonia, uh, something that's really kind of consolidating in one region. So for example, this patient right here, I would say, oh, maybe this is bilateral fluffy infiltrates because it's kind of fluffy. It's kind of like diffuse. So it seems more like an infiltrate. Here, this is more like uh, a consolidation. It's kind of consolidated one region. And so I think this one you could call a consolidation. Either way, either of these you could just say opacities or densities or anything like that and you would still be fine. Okay, so if anybody knows any better about the terms of what you're going to use to describe these x-rays, just let me know and I can put it in the notes below. Okay, so let's just do a brief summary and review of everything we learned today. So when you're first interpreting a chest x-ray, the first thing you need to determine is AP or PA, and then you have to check RIPE, which is rotation, inspiration, position, and exposure. That's to assess the quality of the radiograph. ABCDE is what you're going to use to go through a systematic approach to reading the radiograph. Airway, bones, cardiac, diaphragm, and everything else. White visceral pleural line, absence of lung markings, deep sulcus sign, pneumothorax with mediastinal shift, what are these? Well, I already spoiled the answer a little bit, but these are all signs of a pneumothorax. And this one here with the mediastinal shift would be a tension pneumothorax. 
Hampton's hump and Westermark sign. These are signs of a PE. They are not sensitive, but they are somewhat specific. Widened mediastinum. This is concerning for aortic dissection. Water bottle heart. Remember, this is what you're going to get with a pericardial effusion. Cardiomegaly, cephalization, curly B lines. These are all signs of congestive heart failure. Meniscus sign. This is a pleural effusion. Remember, you're going to have the blunted costophrenic angles. Identifying location of the pneumonia, we reviewed how you have to actually look at the lateral x-ray and determine if it's in the upper lobe or lower lobe or middle lobe based on the lateral x-ray, not just the frontal x-ray. And the spine sign is a sign where the spine gets brighter as you go inferiorly, which shows that there's some kind of consolidation or density in that area. Okay, we went over the differential for an opacified hemithorax. If the tracheal deviates away from the opacified area, that would be a sign of a massive pleural effusion. If it deviates towards, it would be collapsed lung or a pneumonectomy. And if there's no tracheal deviation, then that would be a possibly pneumonia or something that would not cause tracheal deviation. Placement of lines and drains, we know over endotracheal tube, central line, uh, NG tube, and Dobhoff tubes. Uh, lung hyperinflation, flattened diaphragms, barrel chest, these are all signs of COPD. Free air under the diaphragm, that is pneumoperitoneum, as well as Wrigler's sign, which is that enhanced contrast of the bowel wall. We went over small bowel versus large bowel, and we went over small bowel obstruction, which is the slinky sign or stack of coin sign. All right, so I'm going to put some of the PIM questions I asked down in the description below, so you can copy them if you would like. But otherwise, I hope this was helpful. I hope you guys learned something, and thanks so much for watching.